Good afternoon, handy men and women. So today I'm delivering on a promise I've been making to y'all for quite a while, and that promise is that I was going to tell y'all what tools you need. I have spent the entire day completely emptying out the van, going through every single tool that I have, organizing them into different sections, and making a very comprehensive list. So what I can promise you is by the end of this video, you are going to have a list of every single tool that you could possibly need at least to do what I do, which is working for property management companies. There's really no limit to the number of jobs, the types of jobs they give me. So you're literally going to have a list of every single tool that you could possibly need. And that doesn't mean every now and then you aren't going to find out that you need something kind of special uh, and different that you're going to have to run and purchase. But if you were to get all of this, you could do probably 99% of the jobs that are ever going to be assigned to you with only the list that I'm going to give you. Um, let's see. There are links in the description. One of those links is for my Amazon store. I've gone through and not all of the tools, but probably 85-90% of them, I've found either the exact tool that I use, the exact tool that I like, that I think is the best tool and that I personally carry, or if they don't have that, I've found the closest tool to that. Also, I've kept in mind the pricing and everything. There are some things where I've found you the more, let's say, valuable as far as uh, how much work you get done per dollar spent on the tool. And you do need to keep in mind you don't <clears throat> you don't need luxury tools. You know, we're not here to show off. This is not a lifestyle channel. This is a how to run a business channel. And the way that you run your business properly and profitably is to make sure that you're always just getting the tools that you need and using them properly. So, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, one last thing before we get started. If you receive value from this, if I'm providing value to you that you're not having to pay for on YouTube, do me a favor, reimburse me for that value that I've provided simply by liking and commenting, sharing, subscribing. Uh, those things really help me out a lot. I put a lot of work into these videos and I'm happy to do so for nothing in return. But if you do find value, please try to return some of that value in the form of interacting with me on this channel because that does help the algorithm. It helps me grow and it helps me get to a point where I can devote more and more and more time to this channel. So let's get started here. Every tool that a handyman needs. Cordless power tools. So hammer drill. This is for me actually a very big one. You're going to need a hammer drill. You may think you're not going to. Maybe you've never needed one before. But you're going to have block walls around backyards with gates attached to them. If nothing other than that, you're going to have to have a hammer drill just to drill into those block walls for the gates. Uh, you're also going to have to have a hammer drill for the bottom of the slider closet doors there's a guide down there and that guide is often in a concrete floor and you're going to have to drill down into that concrete floor sometimes to install that guide uh, don't epoxy it in place that's not a good way to do it that's the sort of the, the cheat the hack and it doesn't work i'm always drilling those in when somebody else has epoxied them down excuse me for a second my allergies are just absolutely horrible Next is going to be a brad nailer and a framing nailer. Now these are all my cordless tools here. So cordless brad nailer. And I'm going to tell you all something. They're not cheap. I didn't buy one until maybe a year ago. Before that I had my compressor and I had my brad nailer that was pneumatic. And I hate carrying around that compressor because there's only so much room in the van and you need to be able to get up in there and walk around and find what you need. And when you've got that big compressor in there, it just makes it all that harder. And that was sort of the last thing that I needed that compressor for, except for a framing nailer. But I don't keep the framing nailer with me. I keep the framing nailer at home, the pneumatic one I keep at home. And I only need it when I'm working on fascia or porches and fences and stuff. So I'll just bring the compressor and the framing nailer that day. But I bought this Brad nailer. And guys, I felt like such an idiot for never having bought one before because I use that thing 
all the time. Even when I'm not using it necessarily as the permanent way to attach something, it's even handy just for tacking something in place real quick while you get everything else sorted and get stuff put on just the right way and attached just the right way. But I put on baseboard with it. Uh, there have been times where I tack in my fence pickets if I need very precise spacing for like a really nice house and I don't want it to be so permanent until I have it all spaced out and ready. So that's a very important tool. If you can afford to get one, I highly suggest getting one. I've never regretted getting mine. And then as I mentioned with the framing nailer, you can also get a cordless framing nailer. Um, they work pretty good. You don't want to build a house with a cordless framing nailer. But if you're just replacing a little bit of fascia or you're just like say rebuilding, like building a new gate to go on a fence because the old gate's falling apart, those cordless framing nailers are pretty good. Next is a circular saw. Uh, everybody has to have one of these. You're absolutely going to need it. And you need to practice with it a lot. Use it every chance you get. Get better and better and better at it. Because I can tell you, in all honesty, I can look you in the eyes and say, I can use a mechanical pencil with a really fine lead. And I can draw a line down a piece of half inch plywood when I do the sink bottoms that need to be replaced. And I can split that line with that circular saw. I mean split the line right in half and that was not a skill I had even two years ago. I was always a jigsaw guy because when I was in the fourth grade I got my first power tool and it was a jigsaw and I got good at it and then the rest of my life that was my heuristic. I was good with jigsaw so every time I needed to cut something I'd cut it with a jigsaw and circular saws for me were only for like large pieces of lumber where the cut didn't matter so much. But get your circular saw get good at using it. You can cut just as well with a circular saw as what most people can cut on a table saw. Next, reciprocating saw. So your reciprocating saw, to tell you the truth, I don't use them a whole lot, but one thing that I do use it for, actually two things. One thing I use it for is uh, trees, like fallen trees, fallen tree limbs. You're not going to take down a whole tree at the trunk with one, but when giant branches are broken off and you need to remove them, those reciprocating saws are really nice, and you can get a brush blade for it, which is a really, really jagged, aggressive blade that just rips that wood right on out. So you're going to want to have one of those, and it's good for other things. The second thing is a lot of the houses here have posts that stick out of the end of the house, like where the roof trusses and stuff are, and those posts will rot. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll cut like three inches off. Reciprocating saw is real nice for that, if you can cut a straight line with it. Uh, cordless jigsaw. I don't use it all the time, but every time I've used it, I've been pretty grateful that I have it. Because, of course, now jigsaws, those are good for when you need to cut curves into sheet stock, basically. So say when I'm installing kitchen sinks, or replacing countertops and putting a new sink in a countertop especially, I'll use those jigsaws for that. Uh, router, main purpose you're going to need the router for most of the time is going to be when you replace an interior door. It's not going to come with the hinge slots mortised into it. You're going to have to mortise those in yourself and you're going to use a router for that. So go ahead and get yourself a cordless router. Uh, you'll use it on other things, but that's the main use that I found for it. Multi-tool. Those are the, the ones that just vibrate back and forth like that. I thought those were BS most of my life. I mean, those have been out. I remember looking at them when I was in the Air Force, and I got out of the Air Force in 2003. So, And they were corded back then. Um, but they were junk back then. And they were junk five years later, and they were junk ten years later. And somewhere along the way, though, they stopped being junk. I finally got one when I started this business, maybe six months in. Never looked back. I love, 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 love it. It's great for intricate, precise little cuts that you have to do on things. It's also great for when you're replacing fascia, because I do a lot of fascia replacement, and you have to get up in between the fascia and the board that it's attached to, and you have to cut those nails. And then you've got... Sorry. Let's come down here. So you got your fascia going here, and you have the board that it's attached to. You can get it up inside between the two and cut the nails, and then the sheathing on the roof is also nailed down to that fascia, so you can get it up in between there and cut those nails, and then slide that piece of fascia out and slide a new piece back up in. It's got a whole lot of really good uses. I use my multi-tool all the time. Grinder. Okay, so you're going to need 
two types of grinders. Your cordless grinder is going to be a pretty standard grinder, like a four and a half inch or whatever size they are. You know, they've just got the wheels on them that are about that big. And what you're going to use that for mostly, or at least what I use mine for mostly, is with a cutoff wheel, and I'm using it to cut off anything that's metal. So a lot of times that also has to do with the gates to the backyard. You'll have a metal gate with like a metal latch attached to it, and you need to cut that off. Or the rails for the sliding closet doors. What I do is I keep a 72-inch rail at all times. So then if I'm doing a 36-inch wide closet uh, rail replacement, I cut my 72 inch down. If I'm doing a 48 inch, I cut the 72 inch down. If it's 68 inches, cut the 72 inch down. It's real nice and handy and quick for just cutting metal real fast. Uh, the second grinder you're going to need, I'm going to talk to you more when we go to the corded power tools, but essentially the second grinder you need is going to be a corded grinder and you want to get a big one. You want to get a big, giant, heavy-duty one. And what you're going to use this for is you're going to put a diamond blade on this thing. And you're going to use it to literally cut right through block. If somebody wants a new gate installed in their block wall where there was previously just a block wall, you can cut right through the block wall. You can cut through cinder block. You can cut through slump block, brick any kind of masonry you get that big eight inch diamond blade and you it just slices through it like butter do not go to home depot and rent their big gas powered humongous one that's got a blade like that big i tried that once and it's how i ended up with my eight inch was i tried that once and it was junk it wasn't cutting worth anything it was throwing all sorts of masonry onto me making way too much noise couldn't breathe and I called my dad, who's a mason in Mississippi, and said, Hey man, what do you do when you need to like... Because I literally had a wall. It was a slump block wall around the backyard. And the guy wanted to open up this little 36-inch gate. And he wanted to essentially make it six feet wide and put a, opposing gates on each side. And my dad said, just go buy yourself a good, good, good grinder. Put an 8 inch diamond blade on that thing and be really careful. So I'm not telling y'all what to do or not to do. I think y'all need to be safe. I will tell you that those things will kick back. And I mean they will, if they grab, they're powerful and they will go wherever they want to go. And if your body's in the way, it's going to go through your body. So be super careful if you use it that way. But that's my use for it. I'm going to treat y'all like adults and let you make your own decisions in life. Uh, shop vac, it's real good to have a cordless shop vac. You can get a corded one too. And I have corded backups for most of my cordless tools. But a cordless shop vac that you can just plug that 18 or 20 volt battery into real quick just to clean up your mess when you're done is real handy. Uh, heat gun, don't need heat guns a lot. But they're, they're handy for two main things. One is... And I, don't, I haven't done this in forever, but if you needed to patch a screen, they make these screen patches that have like a hot glue type of thing on them, and you can use that. I've only used that like three times when I was specifically requested to do that because it's cheaper than rescreening, but you may need it for that. And what I typically will use it for, though, is if I'm trying to get my mud to dry faster. You don't want to heat it up a lot because if it dries too fast, it'll really crack and it won't sit well. But if you hold it back a little ways, you can even set it up like on a ladder, zip tie it or something, so that it's just making the area, let's say it's winter time, you know, and the heat hasn't been on because it's a vacant house, and it's just going to take a while to dry. Set it back two or three feet, have it pointed in that general direction so that where your patch is, it's just like 120 degrees instead of 48 degrees, so it'll dry faster. Uh, fan... Fans are your cordless fan is really just to keep you cool. A lot of these a lot of these houses you work in are going to be vacant or even if they're not vacant, the tenants just won't have the uh, air conditioning up very high. And when you get into a little bathroom or a little closet, any sort of small enclosed space and you start working hard, just your body heat coming out is going to heat that whole place up. So you want to get some airflow going. You're also going to want some corded fans and those are for drying up from when there's a leak. And, you know, like the carpet's all soaked, but we'll get into that when we go to the cordless tools. And then last but not least, a radio. And, of course, the radio's not 100% necessary, but I really enjoy mine. 
I, I, I say you should get a Bluetooth one so you can just play stuff from your phone. And also what I've noticed is if I, you know, I need some sort of mental stimulation all day. So I've always got either a podcast or an audio book or something going or I've got something on YouTube going. And I'm never watching, I'm just listening. Uh, but it helps me get through my day a little bit better. And if I use my phone speakers, it will kill the battery on my phone in like a half day. But when I use the Bluetooth to a separate radio, the battery just doesn't seem to be affected nearly as much by the Bluetooth as by the actual speakers playing. So that's your cordless power tools. Next, fastener drivers. Uh, you're going to need Phillips screwdrivers. You're going to need long ones and short ones. Uh, for a multitude of reasons. I'm not going to get into every example, but you do want the long ones and you do want the little tiny jeweler's ones as well and every size in between. You want all sizes of Phillips, so you want the number two, the number three, the number one. Um, and then also, I don't believe number one is considered precision, so you also want precision ones. Uh, you're both Phillips and common slotted. With your common slotted, you're also going to want a nice, good, thick one. Uh, and I, the, the common slotted, now those are, the way that those are laid out, it's not like number one, number two, number three. They tell you the length of the flat portion on the tip. So you're going to want at least one large one. And the reason you want that large one is because that's going to be, it needs to be large and long. And that's going to be your main tool for when you do garbage disposals. There's two bolts that you're going to have to get every time on a garbage disposal. It's easier if the screwdriver is long, so you can get a smaller angle going into it. It's also easier when you go to screw. Once you pick the new garbage disposal up into there, you have to turn this piece to lock it onto the garbage disposal. And you have to turn it all the way to where it pops and locks. And it, you can use any number of tools, but you're, it's got little little holes in it like that and you have to put something in that hole and then use it as a pry bar to turn it and what I found is the very thick common slotted screwdrivers work best for that so that one tool is going to take care of multiple items when you're doing your garbage disposal replacements uh, so yeah you just you want a good assortment is really all I'm trying to say you want Phillips and common and you want a good assortment and you're also going to want some small torque screwdrivers uh, those are especially going to be because of exhaust fans in the bathrooms, the motors on them. You're going to replace a lot of these working on rentals. They go out constantly. Like every third move out, I'm doing an exhaust fan replacement. And like every 10th or 12th work order for occupied homes where the tenants are living there, like every 10th or 12th, maybe 15th, you know, quite frequently, it's because an exhaust fan in the bathroom is out. And when you go to change that motor, the screws are almost always going to be Torx. And they're very teeny tiny Torx. But you're going to run across, across random Torx on microwaves, ovens, all sorts of appliances. So make sure you have a good set of Torx screwdrivers. Next, corded power tools. Compressor. I don't keep mine with me, like I said. I know in advance if I'm going to be needing... Basically, the way it works is I'm going to need my staple gun or my framing nailer. Those are the two situations where I'm going to bring my compressor. Uh, you're going to need a chop saw. Oh, and the compressor, by the way, I, I believe I have a 20-gallon, and it has wheels on one end and a handle on the other. I think that's the best one. The pancake compressors don't have wheels and you just have to luck them around everywhere. They're typically louder. They have smaller tanks that are not going to keep up with a framing nailer. Uh, the upright ones with the wheels, those are top heavy so unless you strap them into the back of the van they can fall over. They're also bigger and heavier. You don't need anything that large but you can get a really good like 20 gallon Craftsman compressor. I've actually got one in the Amazon store that oddly enough is it's the newest version, but it's exactly the one I have, and I absolutely love mine. And then you want backups for all of your cordless tools. So just go back to the cordless tool list, and I'm going to give you all a tip on these backups for the cordless tools where you want to get the corded. Get nearly all of these corded tools, almost all of them. I, I've got plenty of them in uh, the Amazon store. And you can find all kinds of them at Home Depot, but I'm going to tell you where you really need to get these is just pawn shops and garage sales. Because the old one, the, the older they are, the better. 
Typically, they have very strong motors in them. They were built to last, and you're not purchasing these for everyday use. These are all essentially, they serve two purposes. One is to be a backup to your cordless in case you run out of battery power or in case your cordless tool dies. It's just good to have a backup. But number two, it's to actually prevent your cordless tools from being overused. So for example, with a hammer drill, you know, I have my cordless hammer drill and it's not the top of the line best cordless hammer drill you can get. What mine is, is it's more of the, the lower end and it's really only good for either drilling very tiny holes into cement or larger holes into cinder block and stuff like that. And that's because most of these move outs, and if I'm using a, a hammer drill, it's probably for one job on any particular day, and it's not a whole lot of holes. Then I have this big, powerful hammer drill that has to be plugged into the wall. And this is the one I use when I'm going to be drilling, like say I'm doing all the posts on a back porch, like five posts across a back porch, and they've got to have these big old three-eighths or half-inch bolts holding everything down into the cement. That's a lot of wear and tear on a cordless hammer drill, because the cordless hammer drills, they do work, and they work well, but they are not the professional version. They are not going to be doing a good job at just getting tons and tons and tons of large holes drilled in cement. So you want your corded for that reason. Uh, and same thing with skill saw, everything. All of these tools, you don't want to run all your batteries down, overheat them, shorten their lifespan, and abuse your cordless tools. Your cordless tools are, me are meant to be, imagine light infantry. Cordless tools are for like a light infantry member to like zip in and take care of business and zip out. The corded tools are for bigger, longer, heavier duty projects where you're going to go in and you're really going to set up camp and you're going to be there for a little while and you want to be a little bit more efficient and not destroy your tools. Next. Wrenches and pliers. All right, we'll just go down this list. You're going to need pipe wrenches, three sizes. You want a little one, a medium one, and a very large one. Crescent wrenches, same thing. Medium, very little, and very large. Channel locks, two sizes. You want a pretty big size. You're not going to need that big one often, and then you want a medium. I'm not going to say to get a little one. I don't think there's ever a situation where a small pair of channel locks is really the best tool. Uh, so two sizes there. Vice grips. You need some sort of like needle nose vice grips. And when I say standard, I just mean standard. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Just a regular pair of vice grips. Relatively large pair that you can grab onto stuff real hard with. Uh, you're going to need needle nose pliers. I recommend two sizes. One size is going to be, I guess, what I would call medium slash normal, and the other one is the extended articulated ones. They're like double jointed, or if you don't get the double jointed one, at least get one that's a little thinner down towards the tip with a finer tip and a longer handle that you're going to use to get into very tight spaces and mess with very tiny things. Uh, dikes, you need two sizes of dikes, just a nice big pair for cutting like huge wires and stuff and a smaller pair for zip ties or whatever uh, if you want you can get some flush cut dikes and those are good for zip ties because they don't leave the little pokey end on there that comes more from my aviation background is a big no-no to uh to to leave those ends to not use your flush cut on those but in the handyman world it's probably fine uh, lineman pliers. These are the pliers that are for fences and bailing wire and stuff like that. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look them up. And then finally, you're going to want a Gerber or a Leatherman multi-tool. Now, I'm not saying there aren't other brands that also make quality, but these two do make quality multi-tools. If you buy a cheap multi-tool, you're going to get a cheap multi-tool. It's going to break on you. It's going to bend on you. It's going to lose its strength over time. It's going to become loose and wobbly. Don't get it. Even the expensive ones are like, they're like 85 bucks, you know, or you can get a super nice one for 150. But get yourself a good Gerber and or Leatherman. Next, chisels and files. Standard wood chisels, three sizes. You want like a quarter inch, a half inch, or maybe a three-eighths, and then a three-quarter or a one-inch. But have a little one, have a medium one, and have a large one. And mostly what I use those for are door frames. So when, when a tenant calls, and this is another common job, when a tenant says 
that a door is not latching properly, it's not shutting properly, it's not shutting all the way. When there's a problem with the opening and closing of the door, quite oftentimes it's going to be your strike plates. And if it's your strike plates, quite often you're going to need to move the strike plate a little bit. Well, first you want to check your hinges and stuff. Make sure the door is secured the way it's supposed to be secured. Make sure the knob or handle is in there the way it should be. But once you've figured all that out, you may just be moving a strike plate. And when you move a strike plate, one of the things you're going to need to do oftentimes is chisel some wood away on that frame. So that's what the chisels are for. Yeah, you can use a common screwdriver. You can use a razor knife a utility knife you can use a lot of things but chisels are made for removing wood like that they're gonna do a very pretty very professional job and you're gonna look like a professional and moreover you're gonna be a professional using the right tool for the right job is part of what it is to be a professional in this industry you know and when you're first starting out and you don't have money for all these tools there's nothing wrong with just <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do man I've done it a million times <clears throat> but if you have the money to invest into the tools, get yourself some good chisels and use them properly. You're also going to need one large cold chisel. This is one of my favorite tools. I mean, one of my absolute favorite tools. I bought a cold chisel more than 15 years ago. And this cold chisel I bought more than 15 years ago is still in pristine condition. And I, I'm a caver. I used to go exploring caves and looking for new caves. I have chiseled away at limestone and other types of stone to open up holes to pop into a new section of the cave. I've, I've beat this chisel millions of times. I have beat the shit out of it. In fact, the back end where the hammer hits is completely mushroomed out. But that hardened cold point on the end is still like the day that it was brand new and these are going to be great for busting up any for like making cuts along brick you can take your brick and lay it down if you know where your line is and you just tap 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 and you kind of score it and turn it and score it and turn it and score it and you keep doing that and one of those taps you get a little harder and that brick will just come right open right where you wanted it to come open at among many 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 other things but that cold chisel i wouldn't leave home without uh, standard file two sizes by standard file I mean just the regular file that you're used to seeing you want one that's relatively large one that's kind of medium you don't really need a small one but you will need a set of tiny files and these aren't gonna look like the bigger that's not the bigger file but smaller they're gonna have rounded ones they're gonna have like cup shaped ones they're gonna have all sorts of different shapes and they're gonna be small and they're gonna have little handles and this actually also applies to these doors. So a lot of times what you'll be able to do is you might notice that strike plate just needs to come down a sixteenth of an inch, but somebody's put so many screws in and out of this door frame, you're afraid to remove it and try to move it down because there's just not much wood to grab. Well, in that scenario, what you can do is you can take a good file and in literally two minutes, you can file a sixteenth or more away from the bottom of that strike plate or the front or the back of the strike plate and you can use those files to keep from having to remove strike plates when you're in a door frame that you know it's not going to go back on too well and then of course they're files so any other uh, instances that you need to file things you'll have those around uh, rasp is just good for removing large amounts of wood I don't use mine super often but half the time they come in the kit of files that you buy and even if they don't they're super cheap and you're not going to use them all the time but when you need one you're going to be happy you have it and it's going to cost you like five bucks or less to buy it so i suggest getting one uh, and then the small round file the round file is the important one i've found for the the door strike plates if i'm gonna use a file it's the the per it's just perfectly sorry it's like a rod just a small quarter inch rod you do want to make sure that the file goes all the way to the end sometimes the filing surface will stop and there will be like another half inch of bare metal you can't get that all the way in to the door frame where your notch is so either cut the end of that off or just get one where the filing portion of it goes all the way to the end because you can get a lot of pressure down on those small round files and you can remove a lot of material really fast with them Next, manual hand saws and cutters. So you're going to need a standard utility knife, and I usually get about five of these. Like, I just, I, when, if I'm in Home Depot and I see they have like a two-pack for $7, I just buy it whether I need it or not. 
because you can't have too many utility knives. You're going to have them laying in buckets and boxes and in the cab and in your pocket and in your backpack. Just have them everywhere because you need them all the time. Yeah, and they're, again, they're cheap. Just, just have them around. Uh, drywall saw. I don't use this as much anymore. I used to, but I still do use it sometimes. Uh, it's especially handy, like, working up on a ceiling. If you've got a hole in the ceiling and you need to go cut that hole out into a square, sometimes it's, it, you don't want to be right under it because everything falls on you. But with that saw, you can move over and you can cut over here a little bit. And it just makes it a little bit easier. And again, that's one of those like $4 items that just grab one, you know. Uh, coping saw. Now, I don't personally cope my baseboard. However, I've found other good uses for the coping saw here and there. If you do cope baseboard, you definitely need to get one. And if you don't, maybe you want to try, see if it's for you. Uh, but you know, I get these, like I've bought these out of the Ace Hardware discount bins. Super, super cheap. And when they come in handy, they come in handy, you know. Uh, let's see. A flush cut saw slash pool saw. These are like the Japanese saws. It's a straight blade that goes out like this. And the blade is serrated on both sides. Uh, if it's a pull saw, generally what that means is the cutting is done when you pull towards you. If you've ever used hand saws, one thing you've noticed is if you dig in at the right angle and you push too hard, when you push, the blade just pops out to the side like that. Um, that's mostly if you're inexperienced, but still, you can cut a straighter line with a pull saw. However, it's not even so much about being a pull saw. It's okay if it cuts on the push or on the pull. I don't really care about that. But it's that flexible blade that you want, that nice, long, thin, flexible blade. So I'm going to give you an example of how you're going to use this. Let's say you're laying down... Um, some like a floating floor right and you get up to your door frame and you don't want to cut your floating floor to match your door frame perfectly what you want to do is you want to lay that floating floor down on your on the floor slide it up against the door frame and then you can take your saw and just run it right flush on top of that and you can cut into the door frame and the trim and the casing and whatever's there so that it slides underneath all of that <clears throat> instead of butting up against it. Uh, they come in really handy for a whole lot of things. They make real nice cuts. They're typically pretty sharp and you don't use them a lot, so you're not going to need to sharpen them. If you use them carefully, it's always going to be a nice, clean, thin blade that you can make some precise hand cuts with. Scissors, just any scissors, guys. You're just you're gonna need some scissors sometimes. If you don't have them, it's not the end of the world. But I keep a set with me. And then shears. Now, if you look in my Amazon store, I've got some shears in there that are my absolute favorite. I wish I'd have brought them in the house before this video. And I can't remember the name of them, so you might have to go to the store to find them. But I think it's I don't remember the brand, but the name, the like the 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 the, the, the model of it is Wiss W I S S. These are titanium coated shears. Dude, I've had so many shears and I ruin all of them so quickly and in a multitude of ways. These shears I bought just on a whim because I had ruined two or three other pair and I was tired of using shitty ones. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh I just went and bought another pair. I didn't know they were going to be great, and they've become my favorite. I freak out when I can't find them, and I'll tear the van apart looking for them, because I don't want to lose them. Uh, but shears, very important. You're going to use them a lot. Next, levels and squares. You want a wooden masonry level if you're doing masonry. Now, if you're not doing masonry, I wouldn't worry about the wooden level, but you do want to learn masonry, and you're probably going to eventually get some masonry jobs, and these levels are really great for that purpose. You also want sort of a cheap standard four-foot level. I'm not telling you to abuse this level. I'm just saying when you're a handyman, a lot of times tools get tossed around and thrown in the back of the van and stepped on and stuff falls on them. So you always want a cheap four-foot level, an accurate but cheap four-foot level that can get abused and I just replace mine like every six months. They're, again, they're cheap at Home Depot. You can get like a Stanley, a yellow Stanley or any other number of other ones. I don't recommend the plastic ones. I do recommend the aluminum sort of like I-beam shaped ones. But just get a cheap standard level that you can abuse and not have to be scared all the time that you're going to break it and it's going to be off. And then just replace it when you need to. 
uh, string levels. Those are just the little teeny tiny ones where you run a string line. Say you're building a fence and you want all your pickets to line up so you need to know where that top of all the pickets should be and you need to put a string up and to know that it's level you just clip these little string levels onto there and it'll tell you if it's level. I buy them in packages of five and just toss them in somewhere and if I lose them again they're cheap. I don't mean to sound wasteful guys but time is money. I'm not going to spend, if I have to spend 10 minutes looking for an a item that cost $1, and I'm spending 10 minutes at a rate of $1.66 per minute, that's just stupid to not just buy a handful of those. Uh, smaller magnetic level. Unfortunately, the one that I have is not, it's just not showing up on uh, Amazon, and I really love the one I have, so I wasn't able to put that one on there, but I was able to find the same one in a 24-inch version, so at least you can see what it is, and then maybe you can find that 6-inch or 8-inch version, whatever it is, but a smaller level that's magnetic, this one has LED lights in it and stuff, uh, you definitely need those. Framing square, very rarely need one, very rarely, but when you do, you do, and it's good to have it. And then a speed square, I use my speed squares a lot. That's sort of my go-to method. I really like tri-squares if I'm working in like a cabinet shop, which is what I grew up doing. I like tri-squares the best, but they're, they have a long bar of steel that can be bent, and the way I just, you know, abuse all of my tools, I'm going to ruin them. So I don't keep a tri-square, I keep a speed square, and that's what I use to just mark lines on my stock that are nice and square real quick. Drywall and textures tools. You need a scraper, get a cheap one, abuse the hell out of it, who cares, it's just a scraper, just scrapers are a dime a dozen. And then an assortment of knives, and these look like scrapers, but knives are like a scraper except they're wider and wider and wider and they go up in width. Get good knives. And I mean good knives. Get stainless steel knives. Get high quality knives. If you can afford to. And take very good care of them. Don't put them in boxes where they're going to get beat around. You're going to need the... You're going to do so much drywall work as a handyman. You just need to get used to that idea. You need to practice at it and get good at it. Because it's going to be a lot of your bread and butter. And you want to have very good knives for doing that. Same thing with finishing trowel. Your finishing trowel is a, a tool that's used on both cement and plaster and on drywall, but your finishing trowel is going to be a very useful tool for a lot of your textures. Same thing with a float. I know a float typically you don't think of as providing a texture, <clears throat> but floats can be used for doing different types of textures. Uh, I do recommend, by the way, on YouTube, watch the... what's the dude's name? The Kilted... He's the kilted something. You look up like drywall, that kilted guy, and he's going to show you so much. I've learned half of what I know about drywall from him and from other guys online, but he's always got a good video for whatever it is I'm trying to learn. Uh, and then you're going to have to choose. Are you going to be a pan guy or a hawk guy? A pan is the square pan. It's long, rectangular, a couple inches deep, and you do all your mud in there. A hawk is a stick with a big flat square plate on top and you do all your mud work on top of that. For me, I'm a hawk guy, but you're going to need to pick hawk or pan. Maybe get both and try them both, although I have to say I think a lot of people stick with a pan because they tried the hawk and it was complicated for them, but I feel like if you put in the time and energy to get better and better and better with a hawk, it's much more useful than the pan, and the cleanup is a little bit faster. It's not a lot faster, but it is a little bit faster, and any time I can shave minutes at $1.66 a minute, I shave those minutes. And then finally, a multifunction knife. This is a hard one to describe. I know you've seen them, but it's like a scraper. In fact, it makes a great scraper. You could probably even just not buy a scraper and just buy two multifunction knives. One of them is going to be used as a scraper and get abused, and the other one you're not going to abuse. But it's, the, it's like a scraper, you know, flat scraping tip on the end, and then on one end it's pointed and comes in. On this end it's flat 
and then comes in and it has like a rounded notch that you can use for helping to clean out your like paint rollers and stuff. These things have a million uses. If you get one with the right base to it, uh, you can use it when you're doing a patch and paint whenever you like pull a nail out of the wall and you've got that little bit sticking out. You can use the handle to like just squish in and push that in so now you've made a divot in the wall instead of something poking out, which is much easier to fill in with your uh, hot mud. So I recommend that multi-function knife. Painting tools. Wagner Power Sprayer, don't use it super often, but it doesn't cost a lot of money. Most of what I use it for is for exterior. I tend to do rolling on the interior, rolling and hand painting, and I only spray on exteriors for the most part. Garage doors is a big one. There, I've, I've painted so many garage doors. I always use my Wagner Power Sprayer because it's pretty easy to just tape around it real quick. You don't have to be super precise about it, and then just spray that door top to bottom. Uh, it takes about two fills of the paint tank, but it's so much faster because, you know, the garage doors tend to have, like, the trim indented into them all, and you can't get a roller into it. So you got to hand paint all of that trim and then roll everything, or you get your Wagner Power Sprayer and you turn an hour job, hour and a half job, into, like, a 30-minute job. Now you made more money. <clears throat> Extendable pole. It's kind of obvious. You need the pole to put a roller on on the end. You just need that for a lot of things. Assortment of brushes and rollers, that's self-explanatory. A roller pail. So this is like the handy pail. It's a pail, but instead of being for dipping your brush in, you know, while you're up on a ladder, the handy pail is a little wider, and it has a little ramp coming out, and that's where you use your little 3-inch roller inside that pail. So if you're going to be working, let's say you're doing, like, uh, painting the inside of a built-in closet with a lot of shelving, and you want to be able to, you know, the big roller, the 12 inch is too big to really be useful to you. A paintbrush doesn't put on enough paint, now you're wasting time. So you use that little 3 inch roller and your handy pail that has the, the flattened area for that roller, and that makes that job real quick. And then a brush pail is just a handy pail but it's not the big fat wide one for the roller it's just a smaller lighter weight one that fits in your hand nicely that you can take when you're up on the ladder like painting around the cutting at the ceiling and stuff uh tarps i do suggest that you go ahead and buy some good canvas tarps i bought like four i don't know what they were 20 by 20 or I think I bought like a 12 by 12 and then a 20 by 20, maybe three of the 20. But anyways, I got a big old stack of tarps, canvas tarps that are going to last me forever. So I'm not buying all that plastic. And that plastic, unless you buy the thick stuff, which costs as much as a tarp, unless you buy the thick stuff, it's just going to just be all over the place. It's not going to lay down. You're going to rip it. You're going to trip on it. So invest in the tarps is my advice. And then a sanding disc. These are the big, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 inch discs that go on the end of a pole. Have a big circular sanding pad on them. So when you're doing full interior paint or like painting a whole room or a whole wall, one of the things you want to do before you go over it with the actual paint is you just want to make sure there's no dimples and stuff sticking out, like little things that have gotten stuck to it or stuck inside the paint. You want a nice flat surface. You're not going to sand the walls with this. What you're going to do is you're just going to put that disc up, and you're just going to, on the pole, you're just going to sweep across all of the square surface lightly from top to bottom. This is going to rough up whatever's there so your paint sticks better, and it's going to remove any inconsistencies that stick out of the wall. Uh, you can also use it for, let's say you texture a wall or a ceiling, uh, unless you just decide that you're not going to. Typically, you want to go back and sand over that real lightly, and that's what you're going to use that big disc for. Because, again, you're not trying to, like, sand the heck out of it. You're just taking it on the pole, and you're just going around and just making sure that you touch over everything and knock down the high points. <clears throat> Next. Masonry. Masonry tools are very cheap. You can buy all of them in one go, stick them in a bucket and never think about them again. You're going to need at least one good trowel. You're going to need a mixing trough or a mixing bucket. Uh, I use the trough. It's these black pans. They're at Home Depot where all the masonry tools are. It's just a black plastic pan that for me is about the right size to dump 
like a half a bag of you know type n or type s mortar into and add the water and mix it in with the hoe and then get it all used up and then it's real easy to just take that pan around and spray it out you can also use just a five gallon bucket you can dump it in the bucket and use a mixer on a drill um, i don't do it that way it's just not the way i do it either way works but you're going to need something to mix in uh, this is where the grinder with a diamond blade comes in. You want to have that large grinder with a diamond blade. That's how you're going to make your good clean cuts into a lot of your masonry. You want your cold chisel. You want a tuck point. And a tuck point is, uh, in fact, look at this picture. In between each brick, that's where all the mortar is. The tuck point helps you push mortar down into that. Uh, the way I was taught in Mississippi, and I'm sure there's a million different ways to do this, I'm not claiming to be like the best tradesman at every trade. I'm a handyman. I know a little bit about each one. But you, you can take your trowel and you can get some mud on the back of your trowel, not the top, but the back, and then you can hold that trowel up to the wall and use your tuck point to just tuck it into there. And then you use your jointer, which is the last thing on the list. The jointer, you can run over it, and it's just gonna, it's got this half moon shape to it, so it just smooths it out and makes this nice, perfect line all the way down. Makes it super pretty. Um, it's pretty common, and I like the way things look with it. And then finally, you're gonna want a wire brush and a plastic brush, or maybe horsehair or something, but you want a wire brush, like a steel brush, and you want a softer brush. And the idea of this is when the mortar is dried to the correct point, you're going to need to clean it off the bricks without scraping it out of the joints. And those flat brushes tend to do a real good job of that. <clears throat> Next. Landscaping and outdoor. Okay, you guys know what all these are. You're going to need a shovel. You're going to need a hoe. You're going to need a rake. You're going to need a leaf rake. You're going to need a rock bar. If you don't live in a rocky area, you don't need this bar. But <clears throat> I come from Texas. In fact, the name of this bar, when you go to look one up on Amazon or at Home Depot, it's going to be called a San Angelo bar half the time. I'm from San Angelo, Texas. And what I can tell you about San Angelo, Texas, is it's the Permian Basin. It used to be at the bottom of an inland sea in Texas. And so it's all limestone and caliche. So anywhere you go in my hometown, you know, you, you have some nice dirt in some places, like in valleys and near rivers. But if you're not in a valley or near a river or a lake, in fact, even near the lakes, what you're going to find is when you dig down very far at all, you're going to hit solid rock. It's like chalk, but it's denser than chalk. And you're going to have to use <clears throat> that rock bar, that San Angelo bar, to just beat it out. And wear gloves and plan on being there all day. Get the one with the diamond tip. It's not made of diamond. It's the shape of the tip. It has a very sharp, pointy tip. You can use that to really, really dig in. And then whenever you've dug in good and you've got some material removed, you can flip it around and use the flat blade end to sort of work those edges back. And then you're going to use the tip to make a hole again and then flip it and use the bladed edge again. Uh, very necessary. Also, here in Tucson, unfortunately, I moved from one state that was really hot, full of mesquite trees, and, uh, and had nothing but rocks in the soil, and I moved to a new state, and a new city, that's really hot and full of mesquite trees and cactus, and has a lot of rocks in the soil. So I messed up there. My bad. You want a pressure washer with a hard surface attachment. Now, here's the pressure washer I recommend. There's nothing wrong with having a good heavy-duty one. I have a gas-powered heavy-duty one. I also have an electric heavy-duty one that's less strong than the gas-powered, but it's much more handy to load up and take with me and use. But my favorite, and what you're going to need to have when you start your handyman business, they make these little electric ones, like Ryobi's. They're, they're like that long, and this wide, and that tall. They're very small. They plug in, and uh, they don't have tons of PSI, but they have what you need for cleaning a garage floor and or the driveway or sidewalk. You're not trying to... Now, if you're obviously, if you're going to be a professional pressure washer, you want something much better because people are going to have very high expectations. But if a tenant just simply leaves the garage floor very dirty and their car leaked a bunch of oil onto it and you need to get it off, you can just take your scraper, scrape all the gunk off, and get your detergent and stuff, pour it on there. And then what they have is... The sprayer attachment, instead of putting a nozzle at the end, they have this round piece. Think of like a lawnmower, how underneath that blade spinning and cutting the grass. Well, what this has is a bar that, uh, that's a tube 
that has holes in the ends of it that point down that spray. So as this thing spins, it's spraying all of the floor, one little thin piece at a time, but a thousand times a minute, and you just basically run that like a vacuum cleaner, nice and slow, all around that garage floor. <coughs> Man, my throat. <clears throat> so, get the pressure washer, start with a small electric one, with a hard surface attachment, and then go up from there when you can afford to. Uh, you're going to need a weed eater. I have a DeWalt 20 volt max weed eater. Came with some 5 amp hour batteries, which is actually the reason I bought it, because when you look at the price of the weed eater and the price of the batteries, and you look at what it would cost to buy those batteries by themselves, the weed eater was almost free, so I just bought it so I could get the batteries, and then it was convenient that I had the weed eater as well. Well, it turns out I love the weed eater. It actually just broke on me, which I'm a little concerned about, because you never know when companies like DeWalt, who have a reputation, you know, the, DeWalt's reputation is not that they're the best. Nobody says that about DeWalt. But they typically have been the good middle ground for a reasonable price, for a reasonable quality. Uh, <clears throat> my weed eater from them just broke. I'm hoping it's an easy fix. I don't know anything about it yet. But you do want a weed eater, and I do recommend you get a cordless one, even if it's just a cheap little Ryobi. You're not going to need it often because you're not a landscaper, but have a cordless weed eater. It could even be a plug-in one, you know, that needs an extension cord instead of the cordless. But get an electric weed eater so you're not messing with the gas and oil and stuff. Uh, lawnmower, same deal, just... You know, if you're going to do any landscaping for your property managers, a lawnmower can be handy. I'm in Tucson. Very few people, if any, have grass here. I have a lot of <clears throat> grass in my backyard because I want grass. But if you live where there's grass and if you live where property managers are likely going to need yards mowed, get a lawnmower. And then a camp saw, which is uh, it's the, the long, thin blade... Then and it, the shape is like this, like the handle is like this, something like a triangle or a square with a very long, thin blade down here, real quick for slicing through mesquite and stuff. Uh, and then if you can, get a chainsaw. I literally just got a chainsaw like last week. I had an old Craftsman that was so horrible I never used it. Finally last week I went and bought myself a good $385 still. Or maybe it was two weeks ago. No, it was about last week. I bought a still finally because I had a tree in the front yard that was about to fall over into the road. So I cut that down. Uh, that'd be nice to have. You don't have to have it, but chainsaws are cool. <clears throat> Mechanic set. So... This I'm talking about, just a nice toolbox, you know, the all-inclusive, it's a plastic case. You want your quarter-inch drive, three-eighths drive, and your half-inch drive. You're going to want metric and English sockets. You're going to want those metric and English sockets in all three drive sizes, and you're going to want them to be both short and long versions, deep well and short well of them. You want the swivels, you want the extensions. You want it to come with all the wrenches, metric and English, boxed in and open in wrenches. Just get yourself, spend the money one time on a very good, high quality box of a mechanics tool set that just simply has every damn thing you need. Just buy it once and have it always. Keep it in your van or your truck. You're going to use it to fix your van or your truck and you're going to use it to fix all kinds of things on these homes. Cleaning kit, kind of obvious. I'm not even going to read these. You want to have a kit for cleaning. You need to clean up your mess when you're done, uh, and you need to be prepared to clean up accidents that happen with your tools and your paints and your solvents and everything else. So have a good cleaning kit. Include plenty of rags and stuff. Plumbing. So, copper sweating kit. You're going to need this, and you're going to need to learn this skill. There's nowhere in the country, no matter where you go, where there isn't a significant number of homes with copper plumbing. You're going to need to be able to fix those, so you're going to need that torch, and the gas, and the solder, and the flux, and some sandpaper. Not a whole lot else. You do want to maybe buy one of those fireproof pads you can put behind it, so if you have to do it inside a wall, you don't want to catch the wall on fire from the inside. But you're going to need a kit for sweating copper, for soldering copper. 
PVC cutters, pretty obvious you need to cut PVC. Copper cutters, that's the little swivel one that you can like tighten down and then turn it around the pipe and then tighten it down and turn it around the pipe so you can cut your copper. If you don't have that, use your jigsaw with a metal cutting blade or honestly any saw that you have with a metal cutting blade. Use your cutoff tool, your multi-tool, doesn't matter. Uh, drain multi-tool. They sell some tools at Home Depot and elsewhere that are purely for drains. They have teeth that stick out the ends. They have a bunch of different functions depending on which one you buy. But essentially their purpose is to fit down into a drain where you have like the mesh over the drain so that the teeth can grab and you can use it to unscrew or screw into a drain. Valve stem kit. These are these long sockets that have a bar that you stick through the end to turn because when you're doing a valve stem, so inside the wall, let's say you've got your shower handles here, you're going to take your shower handles and stuff off, and inside the wall, with the stem sticking way out, there's going to be a nut back there that you need to get on. So these are designed to go over everything back to the main nut, and then you use that bar on the end to crank them out. You're going to need this. Um, you're going to do a lot of valve stems. Most of the time you just have to replace the packings on the end, but you have to remove the valve stem to do that, so you're going to need that kit. Next is a snake. Uh, I hate snaking. Yeah. I do it anyways. They ask me to, and I tell them, hey, you really ought to just send like a plumber out there who's got bigger, better equipment that's really going to clear that drain. But I'll go punch a hole through a drain with my snake if I have to. Ropes and clamps. You need C-clamps, quick grip bar clamps, you need some spring clamps just to hold some stuff in place. Uh, now here's some important ones. The static or climbing rope. You rarely need this, but when you do, Home Depot rope just won't do. So you want to have some Home Depot rope, but you also want to have some climbing rope. This is static line. It's rated. I mean, you can literally like hang a, a car from it, from just one rope. So you're going to need that every now and then. It comes in handy in a million ways. You can use it for like pulling corner posts of fences out of the ground and stuff. This rope does not stretch and then come back together. This rope is static, means that it's designed to not stretch almost at all. I mean, anything can stretch, but it's designed to not stretch. So if, perchance, it breaks or snaps off or something, like a, a chain can come just slamming up into your vehicle if you use the chain. As opposed to the static rope, even if it flies up to the vehicle, it's just rope and it ain't going to hurt anything. And finally, some string. The string is for, like I said before, when you're doing fences and you want them to be level. There's a multitude of things you need string for, but just get yourself one of those rolls of string. To me, that's a tool, not a material. I always keep it on hand. Tool bits. All right, so I'm going to say right off the top, first of all, I recommend the kits. You're going to find kits all the time. They're going to be on end caps at Home Depot and Ace Hardware and elsewhere. But you're always going to be finding these kits, like a DeWalt bit kit, and it's going to have Phillips, Torx, all kinds of stuff. I highly recommend always looking at the clearance sections and buying the discounted uh, bit kits. You may not need everything in there. But what I do is I buy them, I use them, and when I've kind of used up the most important stuff in them that I use the most frequently, I take what's left and I have these, I have like a bit bin where I just throw handfuls of these things. They're separated into what type of bit they are, but I just throw handfuls into there as drill bits and everything in it. And I just toss in whatever I haven't used when I buy a new kit. So I bring my new kit on board, I toss everything else in the old, bigger bin kit, and then I work out of this new kit because it's nice and organized and pretty. And like I said, when it gets kind of dwindled down a little bit and I can't find half the parts or the drill bits are all dull, I just take what's left and I throw it into the... And I've always got the other kit, like in the bin... So if my new kit doesn't have what I need, I can always go to that other kit and it's going to be in there. But the new kit is the lightweight, pretty plastic one that I can just pull out and take in real quick and most of the time is going to have everything I need. But let's go through the list. You need Phillips and Common Slot. You need Torx, Allen, Square. There are square bits It's going to piss you off because here's when you're going to find these square bits that you need. You're going to go to do a fence 
and you're going to go and say, okay, I need to take all the screws out. You're going to start taking screws out, and you're going to be like, damn it, some of these are Torx. And you're going to grab your Torx bit and go, okay, now i got all the Torx. I don't know why they mix those up. And then somewhere down the line, there's going to be like three screws that are going deep into a 4x4, four four, and they're going to have a square bit head. And now you're going to have to go dig through your entire van to find one square bit head. So make sure you do have <clears throat> those square bit drivers. Uh, you're also going to want nut drivers. I love the nut drivers. Those are the ones that are, it's, just, it's essentially like a socket, you know, for a ratchet. It's like a socket, but on the end of a bar that you put into your drill. And you can just use them to zip nuts anytime you have. I, I get gates sometimes on fences where for some reason, I have no clue why, but the handyman who built that gate decided the best way to attach everything would be with nuts and bolts. So there will be literally like 123 nuts that I have to take off from one end. And I just get that driver and zzz, 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 let them all fall to the ground. Who cares? Get your magnetic level and go over there and use that to just pick them all up when you're done. Uh, you're going to need drill bits. And you're going to need drill bits for wood specifically. You're going to need drill bits that are specifically for metal. You're going to need at least one drill bit for ceramic tile and these are and I think you can use them on porcelain too I'm not absolutely certain you read the package do what it says but uh, there's these little conical shaped bits for tile and you're gonna need hammer drill bits I'm gonna tell you right off the bat I've learned the hard way and I still learn the hard way frequently not to buy the cheap hammer drill bits they'll drill about three holes and they'll be dull get the good <clears throat> the more expensive, the better. Get good hammer drill bits. They will last you a long time, and you'll thank me for it. Uh, you also need paddle bits. If you don't know what a paddle bit is, it's like a drill bit, but instead of a giant drill bit, instead of being round, it's just a flat paddle with teeth on the end and one tooth in the middle, and it's sharp, and that's how you make like one inch and bigger holes, even three quarter inch or half inch. But especially when you get up towards one inch, get some paddle bits for that. Uh, hole saws, you don't need them super often, but when you do need them, they're the only thing that will work. So get one very good set of hole saws for metal, and one very good set of hole saws for wood and take very good care of them guys they'll last you the rest of your life because you don't need them too often but take good care of them don't lose the parts and pieces Oops. Uh, router bits just get like an assortment of router bits mostly you're gonna need a 45 degree bevel or a round over those are the two main ones you're gonna need uh, you're also gonna need I forget the name of it but the one you use for cutting hinge slots which is basically just a cylinder and the blade goes all the way to the bottom and even across the bottom so that whatever it touches it removes from the bottom and the top it just removes everything that it touches uh, countersink bit I use this mainly when I'm doing sink bottoms when the bottom of the sink under the sink in the cabinet is rotten and bowed and I'm putting a new sink bottom in I build, I, I measure and cut and build out that bottom on a countertop before I go transfer it down below. And before I do, I use my countersink bit to pick where I'm going to put all my screws and get them all countersunk so that it's pretty when I put it in there and you don't have 20 screw heads sticking up out of the plywood. And finally, a punch set. And the punch set is, uh, it doesn't really go with tool bits. I just don't know where to put it. So the punches are just if you have a nail sticking out, you know, and you need to just like punch that nail head in just a little bit more. Next, blades. So for your circular saw, what I do is I have on my cordless circular saw, I have a very fine tooth blade. Now I'll rip lumber with that fine tooth blade because all it's going to do is it's going to rip the lumber super cleanly. Uh, but if I'm ripping a lot of lumber, I'm using my corded circular saw. If I use my corded circular saw for ripping lots of lumber, that has a very aggressive blade that's made for ripping lumber. So you want to have fine tooth and coarse. The coarse should be on your corded, the fine should be on your uh, cordless skill saw because you're going to be using that. Again, sink bottoms is a good example. I use half inch birch plywood and I use the higher quality half inch birch plywood. I want it to look very nice when I do this job so I don't want it chipping up the surface as it cuts and that's why I use that fine tooth blade <clears throat> reciprocating saw blades you want them for cutting metal you want them for cutting wood and then you want those 
like brush blades that are very aggressive and those are where you can use for cutting branches and stuff. For your grinder, we've already gone over this, you need a diamond blade and a cutoff blade. The cutoff blade goes on your cordless, the diamond blade goes on your larger 7 or 8 inch. Jigsaw. You want a down cut blade and the reason you want a down cut blade is because when you're cutting down into a finished surface like a countertop, you don't want that blade. Most jigsaw blades cut on the upstroke, so they're ripping wood up, and that's absolutely fine if you're cutting like just a piece of plywood to go over something. But when you're cutting into a countertop and you want a clean cut, they make down cut blades, so the blade only cuts as it's going down into the wood, and when it comes back up, it's not cutting. It's only cutting going down, so your blowout is out the bottom rather than out the top. You want a down cut, and you want your up cut blades, some aggressive up cut blades for quick stuff. You want fine and coarse, and you want it for cutting metal and wood. And then finally, your multi-tool, you want the biggest assortment you can get, but you specifically want blades that are for wood. They're going to be very aggressive, and you want blades that are for metal, and this is not necessarily because of the aggressiveness or the speed, but because of how quickly they'll dull if they're not made for metal. When you're cutting through nail-embedded wood, it's going to be real quick that you're going to lose that blade if you don't have ones that are made for that. My goodness, we're still going, guys. There's a lot of tools, but the, the good news is once you get through all this, this is literally all the tools you need. There aren't other tools that I ever need. This is everything I have in my van or in my shop ready to go into the van for the few things I don't always keep with me. This is everything. I don't buy new tools anymore other than to replace the tools that are just getting old and that I'm abusing and wearing out. So for electrical, you're going to need a multimeter, and you're going to need to learn how to use it because you're going to need to troubleshoot some electrical issues sometimes, unless you just turn those down or if you live in a state where you can't. But for example, here in Arizona, as long as it doesn't require a permit and as long as it's under $1,000, I don't have to be an electrician, a licensed electrician, to do some electrical things. So you, I need a multimeter. You likely do too. Outlet tester, for sure, for sure, you're going to need that. Uh, wire strippers, you're going to need those. Voltage tester, that's like the little pin one that you just touch to the wire and it basically just tells you if it's hot or not. I have one, guys. I don't use it. If I need to know if there's voltage, I just use my multimeter because if I'm, if I'm troubleshooting electrical already, I've already grabbed my multimeter, so that's what I do. And then a bulb pole. Uh, it's, I put it under electrical because I don't know where else to put it, but that's the telescoping pole that will go like 20 feet up and you can change bulbs with it. A lot of times you're going to get work orders. These are usually for tenant occupied places or if you're on a move out you're still going to need to change some bulbs. But the work order will basically state that the ceiling is really high and the tenant either is old and shouldn't get on a ladder or is younger but just doesn't have a ladder that can reach. And what you can do is get the pole and even if the pole doesn't reach you can go a few steps up the ladder with the pole and change out bulbs from the floor very handy tile repair you need a trowel and a tile cutter i hate tile you really don't need hardly anything else i only do small tile repairs i don't do big tile jobs so i don't need any tools other than the trowel to put the thin set on and just the regular manual tile cutter where you just stick the tile in there and you score it down and then you break it and you're done easy money <laughs> Ladders. These are, in my opinion, super important. I have whittled this down. I had so much issues with ladders in the for like the first year because I would have too many ladders trying to serve too many purposes. So here's what I got it whittled down to. Minimum 24 foot extension ladder. It's going to be rare that you need the full 24 feet of this ladder, but you will need it. And it's embarrassing to have to tell a property manager, sorry, I can't do that job because even though I'm a handyman, I don't have a tall ladder. Like who does, who calls themselves any kind of tradesman and doesn't have a tall ladder? Well, I did because I didn't have one of those and it was embarrassing. So I got one, but I have needed it many, many times. This goes on top of your van or the truck rack or wherever you're going to put it. Put this out of reach. You're not going to need it often. Next is a large multi-position ladder. These are the ones that 
swivel at the top and you can straighten them out and make extension ladders out of them. You can make A-frames. Some of the cooler ones you can swivel multiple different directions. But that's going to cover most of what you need most of the time. This large multi-position ladder is going to take care of you. Now I put telescoping ladder in here. I don't own one yet but I've used one twice. Twice I've had tenants who saw me carrying in my big bulky multi-position ladder and they said, hey, do you want to use our telescoping ladder? And I'm always open to playing with new tools. So I said, yeah, and guys, these things are like, they're so lightweight and so tiny and compact. And then they just telescope all the way out to where you need them. So I put this on the list because I'm probably going to end up getting one. I think this is just going to become a thing for me. And in fact, I even saw on Amazon, I can't recall if I put it in my Amazon store or not, but I saw on Amazon today a telescoping multi-position ladder. Um, and it can only be so many positions, I suppose, but it was a telescoping A-frame multi-position ladder. The whole thing folded up into this little box, and I thought, my goodness, if I didn't have to have this giant aluminum multi-position ladder anymore, and I didn't have to get up into that hot van, step over all the stuff that I threw in there that I should have put away, trip over it, and pull that damn thing out. If I could just grab this little box of a ladder, That'd be really nice. Now, my favorite, however, is this Gorilla Step Ladder. It's Gorilla specifically. There's a million people that make ladders very similar to this one, but look for this black Gorilla Step Ladder. It has a little tray that pops out that has places to put your paint and stuff, and I think it's only, I believe it's three steps. I don't think it's even four. But man, I tell you what, go to Home Depot, find the Gorilla one. It stands like... You know, about about up to my face here, somewhere in that ballpark. And this ladder is perfectly balanced where you hold it to carry it. I'm just, I use this ladder for everything. It's just tall enough that you can usually get to all the smoke detectors in a house with it. So anytime I can avoid carrying this big, heavy, multi-position ladder in, I use my Gorilla Step Ladder. And then a foldable stool. You don't have to have the foldable stool, but sometimes it's just a little easier to grab that than to grab any other larger ladder. But the three you got to have, 24, exten 24 foot extension ladder, large multi-position ladder, and a gorilla step ladder. Those are the three that I always have with me, and I don't need any others. They cover every scenario. They work very well. Next pneumatic tools you can need a frame and nailer mostly for fascia and porches and fences uh you're gonna need a stapler like i said i don't even have a cordless stapler i probably will someday but i don't yet i don't need a stapler very often it's just on the rare occasion that somebody asked me to do uh like paneling like that cheap paneling and they just that's what the homeowner wants because it's cheap and they say I know paneling is crap but I just want to put up new paneling that's when I'll bring my compressor and my my narrow gauge crown stapler uh, a blower I don't think you really gotta have that but again that's like such a cheap item that if you do have your compressor with you and if you are cutting stuff you might need to blow some stuff around pick yourself up blower we already talked about the compressor. Make sure you got good hoses and long hoses and plenty of feet of hose to get to where you need to because your nearest plug-in may not be super close to the work you're doing. Miscellaneous hand tools. Uh, so if you didn't know, as a handyman, you're going to need a hammer, crowbars, and tape measures. You should just know that, but you're going to need them. I prefer 35-foot Stanley tape measures. That's the only one I use. And then bolt cutters. So if you're working for property managers, they put lock boxes on these houses. And sometimes the lock boxes go bad, and then you're going to get a work order to go cut off the lock box. And to do that, these are built so that they can't be cut with bolt cutters. So you need to buy the biggest bolt cutters that you can get. And they're not going to be cheap. And even with those big bolt cutters, you're still going to need to put one end in your chest and reach out and grab the other end and squeeze as hard as you can until it finally pops through. So, there you go. What's next? Miscellaneous and other 
Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so here's what you're going to need. You're going to need uh, a cooler to put some ice and some drinks in because it's hot. I don't care if you're up in New York State. It gets hot up there during the summer too. So cooler for your drinks, collapsible awning. When you're working outside, guys, you need the telescoping legs, collapsible awning. I went a year without one because I was stupid because they are cheap and I just didn't get one because I was a man and I can work in the sun and I finally got one and I won't go anywhere without it if I know I'm going to be working outside. It takes like two minutes to put up and two minutes to put away. Uh, a hand truck and a furniture dolly are very good to have. I don't keep these with me. I just have them at home and I bring them on days that I anticipate needing them. Extension cords, preferably the ones that have like the block at the end so you have multiple places to plug in. But And get good extension cords. Don't get the little green ones that are made basically for Christmas lights. Get a good extension cord. Fans. Okay, this is actually an important one. Uh, you may or may not be the guy for this, but if there's a leak and carpet is wet and needs to be dried out, if areas of a home got wet and need to be dried out, get yourself some nice, big, powerful plug-in fans so that you can essentially rent those out. You charge money for going to put them up and, you know, to install them. And then you rent them for like 15 or 25 a day, whatever the going rate is for your area, because they need to stay running for days, circulating air to get that carpet dried out. And then finally, a camp chair. Now, last but not least, this is just kind of my wish list. I have some of this stuff, but basically what I'm saying is these aren't things you need on here. These aren't things that I'm telling you, one handyman to another, you've got to have. But these are things I'd love to have, some of which I do have, and which, if you've got the money, can be really handy. Number one is a chainsaw. I told you all I just got one. I like Still. Uh, Still is not on Amazon, apparently, but Husqvarna is. It's just a good chainsaw, though. Cement mixer slash mud mixer. Now, I don't know if y'all have seen this mud mixer product, but this is a product where I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically, once you buy or rent this machine say you want to pour like a 10 by 10 cement pad well you're not going to get the barrel mixer and dump that many sacks of cement in there and spray your water hose in and get it all mixed up and it's going to be set up over here before you get over here but this mud mixer is really cool mud mixer is the name of the machine they're not like sponsoring me or anything i just i found them online and i'm really excited i want to say they cost like I think minimum like 3500 bucks, But this thing has a hopper and you plug your hose into it and it's got some dials and basically you put your mix, your cement mix in the top of the hopper and you turn it on and this auger goes while the water gets sprayed and out the end of this tube just plopping out is, is just perfectly mixed cement once you get all your dials dialed in and you can pour yourself a pad Instead of hiring a cement truck, because I don't know if you ever hired them, but those cement trucks are expensive. Getting the truck there costs more than the cement that's in the truck that you're using. So I would like to get one someday. Uh, maybe I will. You never know. Uh, wood chipper. That's just because I deal with a lot of branches and even just old lumber and stuff when I'm tearing stuff down. And it'd be really nice to just be able to chip everything and then go dump the chips rather than to have to handle all of this bulk brush and lumber and fence pickets and all of that. Uh, trencher, I don't really need one super bad. I just like to have one. Uh, generator, I would really, I would like to have a generator. That's something I don't have that if I had the money I would get. N not a small one, but at least a 3,000 watt. I'd prefer, pre preferably... I would like a 4K or bigger, but I think a 3000 watt would suffice for most of what I do if I could get like a nice Honda EUIS generator that's very quiet, very efficient, clean sine waves coming out of it. Table saw, I have a very good table saw luckily in my shop. I bought it quite a while ago from a rich guy who bought it so that he could... This guy basically bought like $20,000 worth of wood shop equipment, like professional industrial wood shop equipment, and then used it to make the doors in his house because he was bored probably, and then sold all of it. So I bought the table saw. If I'd have had the money, I was going to buy his planer and everything else too, but all I had the money for at the time was the table saw. But they're very handy. Um, spray rig. I don't do a lot of interior painting by spraying. 
it's something I'd like to learn someday, although from what I can tell, it seems like the guys I know who do spray interiors rather than roll them, when it's all said and done, it takes them the same number of days it takes me. They basically put a lot more time into the prep work and a lot less time into the painting, whereas I put... Dude, I, I paint a whole house these days, whole interior, without ever putting a drop cloth down. I've gotten so good at just rolling and hand painting that in five days, four to five days, but usually running on five days, not the, the last fifth day is usually not a four day, a, a full day. <clears throat> but in four or five days, I do a full interior paint on like a 2,000 plus square foot house, closets, trim, everything, and I don't put down any tarps, I don't do hardly any prep, there's almost no tape that goes anywhere, it's all by hand. I've just gotten good at it, but I would like to learn the spraying, because I have a feeling that if I took my hand painting and rolling skills and combined it with some spray stuff, I think I could do even better. And then a wet saw for cutting tile. I don't like tile. I don't have any intentions on getting good at tile, but I'd like to have a wet saw, because sometimes I do just, I have to do the tile work, because I'm the guy they sent it to, and if I don't take care of it, they're going to have to find somebody else, and that somebody else may become competition. So one of the ways that you compete against your competition is to make sure they never get brought on board in the first place. And I believe that's it. Yes, that is it. All right, guys. So um, message me if you all have any questions. Definitely message me if you have better tools than I have, like if you know of better ways uh, and when I say better tools, I don't mean like the higher end version. I mean, if there is a better tool for a job that you know about that I may not know about, because I can also share that information and the rest of y'all can also go to the comments and find them. Um, I do want to remind everybody, I have links in my bio. Number one, I use Jobber to run my entire business, all the way from receiving requests to making quotes to making work orders to invoicing to sending out receipts and getting those invoices paid, to taking credit cards, everything. Jobber manages my entire business. My accountant has his back-end access. Jobber's my thing. I am an affiliate with Jobber. They support this channel because they found me supporting them before they were ever giving me anything for it. So please try out Jobber for your business. See if you like it. If it does, purchase it. There's a link in the description of my page with an exclusive discount, and it'll let them know that you came from me. Uh, what else? going to have a link to my new Amazon store that I just got set up. I did my best to try to find either the exact same tools that I've whittled down to being my best tools, or if they don't have the exact same ones, to get the same brand and an equivalent level of the tool, or if they don't have that, to at least show you what I would buy if I was starting out brand new. You can basically go through that store and just pick anything you want, but don't just pick what I picked, you know? Like, if you go to look at the cordless brad nailer, you know, look at the, bra look at the versions that are lesser and that are more and figure out what those feature differences are and make sure you're buying the right tool for you because what I'm doing is what's right for me but what you need may be something different for you so check out those links again if I've provided value with the work that I put into making this video if I've given you some value please return that favor like share comment engage with me it helps the algorithm it helps the channel grow and the, the more the algorithm gets the channel growing the sooner i can put even more time into the channel i do want to let y'all know one of my uh, final things to say here one of my big goals in the future is i have a room in my house that i would love to turn into a studio for youtube where i essentially build out a fake kitchen a fake bathroom a fake everything and I take y'all, so my jobs list of every single job that my company has ever been asked to do and ever will be asked to do, I would love to make a video library for a how-to on every job. Not a DIY library for homeowners to guide them through and hold their hands, but a video for professionals like you and me who need to know like, hey, what's the tools, what's the materials, what's the best, most efficient way to do this, what do I need to keep on hand to do this, how does a handyman who's trying to make money and be efficient get this job done, and I want to build out that set. So anything that y'all do as far as engagement with this channel gets me closer to that goal, which I think you'll find useful because then I could just become your library that you go to to click on any job, you know, how to build a screen, you never built a screen before, you don't know how to get attention right, I ain't very good at it either, 
but I'm getting better and I'll make a video showing you everything I know about it. So I want to thank you all again for all of your support. I hope this has been useful. Go check out the store. Go check out Jobber. Uh, I love you guys. I hope you all are all out there succeeding and killing it. You all have a great night.